Great. Okay. So uh, today's webinar uh, basically is going to take the, the same structure as the book. So I want to talk about the seven chapters of the book, and I'm going to stick to the same sequence that the book uses. So chapter one is focusing roughly on why we need to raise education achievement. Chapter two deals with a rather tricky issue, which is the research on teacher quality that shows that we can actually show that teacher quality matters, but we can't actually measure it for individual teachers. That may sound paradoxical, but I hope to be able to explain why that's actually nevertheless true. So if we want to improve teachers, the question is, what should we improve them on? And that's where research comes in. Research will never tell teachers what to do, but it will tell them that some things they could change about their practice are likely to have bigger impacts on students than others. So the research is important, and I want to deal particularly with a technique that's been touted by some as being the answer to how do you learn from research, that's meta-analysis. And I want to suggest that meta-analysis needs to be used with caution. So my real message in chapter three of the book is how can we help leaders become much more critical consumers of research? I want leaders understanding the research literature, but they need to be critical about what they're being told about research. Chapter four is going to talk about why formative assessment is at the heart of good teaching. And then I want to spend some time in towards the end of the webinar looking at three specific issues. One is expertise research. What we're learning about expertise in all kinds of domains like violin playing, chess playing, and what the implications of that are for teaching and then thinking about how we might apply that to teacher learning. And then I'll conclude with a few thoughts about what we're discovering is really the hardest problem of all, which is actually implementation. It's as simple as getting teachers time to work on improvement. And in some ways, that's been very frustrating for me to discover that the hardest thing of all is just giving administrators the confidence to let teachers develop their own practice in this way. It turns out to be really important, but really difficult. So why do we need to raise achievement? Well, this graphic here from the McKinsey Company, um, I think is rather interesting. On the horizontal axis, it's got hourly wages, excluding benefits in dollars per hour for the United States. And on the vertical axis, it's got what percentage of the time that they spend in work will be automatable, and each circle is a job, and the size of the circle represents how many people do that job in the US currently. And what you can see towards the right of the graph is a number of jobs which are fairly highly paid. Most of those are medical, so they're surgeons, cardiologists, and you can see that these people have a potential for about 20 to 30 percent of their jobs being automated. But as you can see, for the vast majority of jobs, those paying certainly up to 20, 30 dollars per hour, there's a very high probability of automation. Uh, to sort of quantify that, um, Alan Blinder at Princeton has estimated that between a quarter and a third of all jobs could be offshored, and about a half of all jobs could be done by machines. So roughly 75 to 80 percent of the jobs that are currently being done in the US will not be here in 20 to 30 years' time. So the choice is very simple. They can wait for young, for young people can wait for someone else to net a job for them, or they can create their own. And that's why we're going to need higher levels of education than we've ever had in the past, because entrepreneurial skills, high level knowledge skills are going to be really important in the future. There will always be jobs at the lower end of the pay scale, in healthcare, in personal services, but the evidence is those are going to be less and less well paid because what we're already seeing is what one economist called lousy and lovely jobs. We're seeing a hollowing out of the jobs marketplace. As machines and offshoring are taking jobs away, the people in the middle, if they can't move up to the higher skill jobs, end up competing at the lower end of the skill range, and the net effect is to depress wages at the bottom end. So we're facing a very different challenge from what we used to face. We used to be creating enough knowledge workers to lead the people who made their living by using their muscles, but muscle jobs are disappearing and brain jobs are going to be the only ones left. We need very different kinds of schools if 18, 90% of people are going to be knowledge workers rather than the 20 or 30% for which our systems were designed. And 
I think we need to change our model of schooling. I think too many schools currently function like talent refineries. We teach all the kids the same stuff. Some kids get it, some kids don't. The idea is that talent floats its way to the top. So we actually end up with these kinds of sections of different levels of talent. And we accept this, the fact that some kids don't make it as being completely acceptable. And I don't think we can accept that anymore. I think we have to move towards talent incubators or even talent factories. And I think the, the best example of that is the motto that Jeffrey Canada used in the Harlem Children's Zone, that every kid is going to succeed and they're going to do whatever it takes. So just as one illustration of that, if you're getting a bell curve of student distribution of, of achievement, then, you're not, then schools aren't, aren't doing anything because the bell curve is what nature gives us. If we're getting a bell curve of student achievement, then it means the education isn't actually affecting the way things turn out. So I think the really powerful thing is to say, somehow we need to find ways of getting more support to the students who need it to destroy the bell curve. How do we do that? Well, the simple answer is teacher quality. And we need higher quality teachers. And the important point is that this is not going to be achieved in the way that most people in the US seem to think it's going to be achieved, which is by, by, by firing bad teachers. Now, before we talk about teacher quality, I want to stress that teaching quality is not the same as teacher quality. So the quality of experiences that young people get in classrooms depend on the quality of the curriculum that they're being exposed to. Uh, there's quite some evidence that, relatively speaking, US curricula tend to be relatively less coherent than many of the curricula in the Far East. So that actually progression in conceptual development is much smoother because the curriculum is designed to promote that in many Far Eastern countries much more strongly than it is in the US. Typically, US teachers are in front of kids for about a thousand hours a year. It's very common in the Far East for teachers to be in front of kids for say five or 600 hours per year, which means they have more time to work together to plan good teaching. The smaller the class you teach, the better you're going to do. There's been a lot of discussion about cl class size reduction, but the evidence is actually pretty clear. If you teach a smaller class, you will get better results for your students. The problem with class size reduction is not that it doesn't work, it's just that it's very expensive. The other thing that affects the quality of teaching is the resources available and the skills of the teacher themselves. Now, the important point is teaching quality depends on all these things, but there's now solid evidence that the skills of the individual teacher, the things that the individual teacher carries around with them, are the crucial variable. It turns out that if you take a teacher who is above average in one school and just transport them at random to another school, teaching kids of a very different socioeconomic group, they'll still be better than average. So one of the things we're discovering is that it's something that individual teachers carry around with them that actually makes a big difference to how much students learn. That's why recently politicians have become focused on this issue of teacher, qu teacher quality. And you can improve teacher quality in two ways. You can replace existing teachers with better ones, or you can invest in the teachers we already have. And of course, it's very attractive to think of firing the bad teachers. It turns out it can't be done. It turns out that actually identifying who the bad teachers are is just about right now impossible. Hardly anybody believes this. Um, I didn't believe it for many years. I spent years trying to develop teacher evaluation systems. And what I've discovered is that really, you can't tell good teaching when you see it. Because what you're trying to do in identifying a good teacher is to figure out whether students are going to remember this stuff in six weeks' time. As Paul Sweller points out, learning is a change in long-term memory. If you teach things to students today that they forget next week, then you haven't taught them anything. And so when you're trying to evaluate teaching, what you're trying to figure out is whether what is happening in this classroom right now is going to be remembered by these students in six weeks and maybe even six months' time. And that's why it's so difficult. And in particular, much of what looks like very good teaching is ineffective because it's not difficult enough for the students to make sense of what's going on. Robert Bjork and his partner Elizabeth Bjork 
have coined this rather nice idea of desirable difficulties in learning. They've pointed out that when learning is too easy, it's not remembered for very long. And so some teachers break things down into such small manageable steps that the students find it very easy to follow, but the result is they're not thinking, and six weeks later they've forgotten it all. As Daniel Willingham points out, memory is the residue of thought. And so it's really hard to work out whether what's going on in the classroom right now is going to be remembered by the students in six weeks time. So here's the rather paradoxical point. We know that teachers make a difference, but we don't know what makes the difference in teachers. We could estimate teacher quality by take, testing kids at the beginning of the year and testing them at the end of the year and working out which teachers have kids making most progress. The problem with that is it often doesn't capture the important variables. So for example, in Florida, we test kids reading at the end of third grade and we test them in reading and writing at the end of fourth grade. Now, if you're a fourth grade teacher and you inherit children from a third grade teacher who's done a lot of work on writing, you're going to look pretty great because that writing skill isn't captured in the third grade test, but is going to be captured in the fourth grade test. And so this is a very general finding. Good teachers benefit students for years after they stop teaching them. So value added modeling is very difficult to do well. Observation is very hard for the reasons I've already mentioned. And of course, student surveys are very popular these days. Something like the, the tripod method has gained a lot of attention. But here's the, the really inconvenient truth, if you like, to coin a phrase. If you come up with the best composite that you can of how good a teacher is based on value-added modeling, observation, and student surveys, and when I say best, I mean the one that predicts their test scores the best, you find there's a correlation of 0.69. So on average, the correlation between the ratings that you'll give the teachers and how well their kids actually do is 0.69, which is pretty poor. Here's a bigger problem. If you actually then figure out whether the kids have learned anything that's that's not measured in standardized tests, like higher order thinking, the correlation is even lower, 0.29. And most worryingly of all, the reliability of such an assessment would be 0.51. Now, it's routinely reckoned that you need at least 0.85 reliability for any important test. The SAT and ACT have reliabilities around 0 0.92, 0 0.93. So given that observation of teachers combined with value-added modeling and student surveys only gives you a reliability of 0.51, you're going to need a lot of assessment to actually make, sh make sure the assessment is reliable enough to make a hiring and firing decision. So if we take 0.92 as the benchmark, I've actually calculated that you would need to have teacher data for 11 years on one teacher to get a reliable enough rating whether that teacher was any good or not, even on preparing kids for standardized tests, let alone the things that are more important like the higher order assessments. So I've concluded that basically we're spending far too much time trying to figure out who the good teachers and the bad teachers are in the US when we'd be better off just trying to help all teachers improve. And that's why we need to learn from research. So the question is, how can we learn from research? And as I mentioned earlier, there's this technique called meta-analysis that is very popular, and I think it's going to be very, very powerful in the future. But I think we need to understand that right now, it is much more difficult to apply meta-analysis in education than it is in psychology, for example, and certainly much more difficult than it is in medicine and other fields where it's been well used for over 20, 30 years. So here are the problems of using meta-analysis in education. Perhaps the biggest one is what's called sensitivity to instruction. Standardized tests don't really measure what teachers change. So some tests are really closely focused on what teachers are teaching. So if a teacher does a good job, the student scores go up by a lot. It turns out that most of the tests we use, certainly in state testing, don't actually measure what teachers teach. So the, the tests aren't capturing the difference between good and bad teachers. Just as an example, Maria Ruiz Primo and Min Li looked at studies in, in feedback, and, and they found that when, sens when, when sensitive measures to instruction were used, the effect sizes you got were five times greater than the insensitive ones. So depending what 
measures you're using to find out whether students have learned something, you'll get very different effect sizes. And so you'll think that there's been a big change or a small change. Selection of studies. People forget that many of the studies that are reported in meta-analyses are conducted by psychology professors on their own undergraduate students. By one estimate, about three quarters of all studies on feedback, for example, were done by psychology professors on their own students. Now that's a very good thing to be doing and it can be useful in terms of providing insights, but I think we need to be very careful about applying findings gained in a psychology laboratory to classrooms. So what are the studies being included? What are the inclusion criteria? Those two problems are unavoidable. There are some avoidable problems that actually are also very serious. Perhaps the most important is the file draw problem. It turns out that in psychology or medicine, if a result is significant, you are 12 times as likely to get the result published as if it's non-significant. So the papers that get published are typically the ones that are significant. In other words, they're the experiments where everything happened to go right on the day. The others, the ones that don't get published, are in the researcher's file drawer. So what we discovered is that the studies that are published overestimate the true size of effects. Brian Nozick, who is leading this rather interesting thing called the Reproducibility Project, found that only 39% of papers published in top journals when, done, when the experiments were done a second time produced the same results as the published papers. So there's a real problem with reproducibility. There are other problems with quality. I've mentioned class size already. If you do a, an experiment on um, a meta-analysis on whether class size reduction works, you need to be very careful not to be comparing different kinds of interventions. So a study where class size redu was reduced by 10% will give you a very different finding from one where class size was re reduced by 30%. And in particular, you need to look at whether teachers were given support in using the smaller classes effectively. So the evidence is reasonably strong that a teacher just talking at a class of 20 is no better than a teacher talking at a class of 30. But if you give the teachers support in how to take advantage of these smaller classes, then a very different result might occur. So the important thing is we have to look at the quality of the experiments being included in these meta-analyses. And then finally, and this is a really big problem in meta-analysis, the fact is that students at a younger age are much less variable than they are when they're older. So one year's growth when, for six-year-olds is about one and a half standard deviations. So six-year-olds are very different from five-year-olds. But by the time you're up to, say, 15 years old, one year's growth is only about 0.2 standard deviations. So 15-year-olds aren't really very different from 16-year-olds. The result of this, due to the way that meta-analyses are conducted, is that experiments that are done with younger children give you far bigger effect sizes than experiments that are done with older children. And so if you do a kind of listing of the most successful interventions based on effect sizes, it'll be dominated by those experiments that just by chance happen to be done on young people. And here's the problem. Meta-analysis is being done in education in a way that doesn't address the complexity of these difficulties. In particular, many of the people don't discuss the unavoidable problems and don't avoid the avoidable problems. So that's why I'm suggesting that actually right now, we need to be much more critical consumers of research and in particular leaders need to take an informed choice about where to spend their efforts. For example, it turns out that grouping students by ability doesn't actually do much good. Tracking, as it's called in the US typically, setting or streaming, as it's called in other countries, typically lower student achievement. But in most cases, when students are grouped by ability, the best teachers are given to the most able students. It turns out that if you actually group students by ability, but then gave the best teachers to the students at the lower end of the achievement range, you might actually improve student achievement because more of the lower achieving students are getting access to high quality teaching. So the fact that a research study has a particular outcome doesn't mean that that has to be the way it is. 
research will never tell you what was. Sorry, research will never tell you what might, might be. It'll only tell you what was. And if you think that you understand something about this stu the study that means it doesn't apply in your context, then that's a perfectly legitimate objection to just slavishly following the research findings. The big idea, I think, here is that right now, best evidence synthesis is the best we can do. We shouldn't slavishly follow the results of a meta-analysis to say this is what we should be doing. We should be thinking, is this the right thing for our students in the context of what we are teaching them in the context of our local area and our students' needs. And when you do that, my argument is that formative assessment becomes the top of the list. So I'm listing here 18 studies, each of which is actually a review of research. And between them, these studies draw together over 5,000 research reports about feedback and other aspects of formative assessment. And they show pretty convincingly in every country where this has been studied, at every age of student, and for every school subject, when teachers pay attention to formative assessment, finding out what students know before you move on, involving students in their own learning, feeding back in ways that actually motivate students rather than alienate them, then you get higher student achievement, even when you measure student achievement with standardized tests. Different people define formative assessment in, a, in different ways, but the way that we found most useful in our work is to think about five processes. One is clarifying, sharing, and understanding learning intentions. The second is eliciting evidence of learning. The third is feeding back. The fourth is involving students as learning resources for one another. Peer tutoring, for example, is, it would be an example of this kind of strategy. And then finally, activating students as owners of their own learning. So these five strategies of formative assessment, we think, define the territory. First, make sure the students know where they're going, elicit evidence of their progress, give feedback, and then activate students as owners of their own learning and as learning resources for one another. So that's the kind of bottom-up approach. Start with the feedback on research and then work out how you can actually embed that in classrooms. There's another way to do it, which is top-down. So a group of researchers in Durham, in the United Kingdom, looked at the worldwide research on which kinds of things we could be doing in classrooms to have the biggest impact on student achievement. And they did it in quite a smart way. The first of all, they looked at how much extra learning you get. They didn't say what works, because in education, that's not a very smart question, because everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. The question is, under what circumstances does it work and how much does it work? So they reported this not using effect sizes, but extra months of learning. But of course, that's by itself not a very useful guide. Susanna Loeb at, from Stanford University did a very nice experiment where they used text messages to remind parents to undertake literacy activities with preschool students. Now, the effect sizes they got, the actual amount of extra learning was very small. But the cost was minuscule, like $10 per student. So a, a small effect, a small improvement in students' learning can be very helpful if it's very, very inexpensive to secure. And they also looked at the quality of evidence. So you have these three things. You have the cost, the quality of evidence, extra months of learning. And if you look at the, the top of this first table here, you see that feedback, metacognition, and self-regulation, and peer tutoring top the list of cost effectiveness. These are relatively inexpensive to do with significant impact on student learning with reasonable quality of evidence. Uh, just for completeness, I've included their complete slides, but I'm not going to talk about those. You can actually look at those later if you like. So how does that relate to formative assessment? Well, let's remember what the top three were. Feedback, self-regulated learning, and peer tutoring. So in other words, the three most cost-effective strategies identified by a review of all the research that's been done in education, identified the top three strategies as three of the five strategies of formative assessment. What about the other two? Well, you can't give students feedback until you find out what's going wrong, so you have to elicit evidence, and you don't know what evidence to collect until you find out or clarified where you want students to go. 
So these five strategies of formative assessment appear to be a minimum set for maximizing the impact of teacher improvements on students. So we know from experience we've done that when teachers do more of this formative assessment, their students get better test scores. The question is, can all teachers get better? And this is where I think the research on expertise is very interesting. Because what Andreas Ericsson and his colleagues have shown is that actually elite performance is not generally determined entirely by talent. It's at least as, imp uh, as much due to the amount of practice that people do. And they suggest that elite performance is the result of at least 10 years of maximal efforts to improve performance through this thing they call dis deliberate practice. This is not just doing things over and over again, it's deliberately trying to make yourself better. So many of us have thousands of hours of car driving practice, but most of us aren't any better than we were 10 years ago. So practice, just, just re repeating things, makes performance less demanding, but it doesn't make it better unless you push yourself to get better at the things that you can't yet do. And experts seem to have this commitment to deliberate practice. The really interesting thing is that it's actually not fun. The best violinists, for example, don't enjoy the practice they do. In fact, they hate it. But they do it because it's important in improving their performance. So that's what the research shows about expertise. And this has been widely written about by people like Malcolm Gladwell, Matthew Syed, and Jeff Colvin in these three books, which are all very good. Now, I don't want to overstate the fact. You know, if you want to be a basketball player, being tall is good. As David Epstein points out in the sports gene, if you're a male between the ages of 20 and 40 in North America, and you're six foot three inches tall, your chances of being in the NBA are one in 200,000. But if you're seven feet, the odds are about one in six. So there's no doubt that if you want to be a basketball player, being tall helps. And no matter practice, will actually get you there. But what we're beginning to discover is that while there is an, an element of talent that's necessary for most jobs, most elite performance, practice will make up for an awful lot of lack of talent, if you like, and very few people make it without a huge amount of practice. So what we're discovering is that talent is just as much about practice than some natural gifts. And what's been realized through now years of study and expertise are the following claims. First of all, expertise is very specific. So, for example, grandmaster chess players are no better than average at playing checkers. Um, general ability is often very important for the first year or so. So, people with higher IQ are generally better chess players to begin with. But after a while, the effects of practice completely dominate. And so, at the elite level, it's much more to do with practice than it is about how good you were when you started. Expertise doesn't seem to be reducible to things you can tell people how to do. So the only way to get there is through this continuous practice. It doesn't, there doesn't seem to be, there don't seem to be many fields where you can actually short circuit the process of learning. There are a few, notably chicken sexing, which is really interesting and has been studied by psychologists extensively. But in general, expertise can't be short-circuited. You have to practice to get there. It involves automation, basic routines, and that's pretty obvious, I think. It involves seeing patterns that other people don't see, that non-experts don't see. And I think the most important thing is that typically experts don't have more knowledge, although they often do, but the most important thing is how their knowledge is organized rather than how much knowledge they have. And that's why it takes time, because what you see as people develop expertise is changes in the organization of their knowledge rather than just acquiring more knowledge. So the research on expertise shows that 10 years of deliberate practice is required for a high level of performance. And as far as we know, expertise in teaching looks pretty much the same. 
So the research that's been done in teaching, particularly by David Berliner and his colleagues, shows that expertise in teaching shares the hallmarks of expertise in other domains. Now you could argue that teaching is different, but for this to actually negate the argument I'm making, you'd have to argue that for the expertise research not to apply to teaching, you have to say that all the other areas that have been researched are similar to each other and teaching is somehow different. And I don't think that's the case. So as far as we can tell, what's true for expertise in all the areas that have been studied is likely to be true for teaching. 10 years of deliberate practice to get levels of expertise. So do teachers get there? Do teachers do 10 years of improvement? Well, the evidence is that they don't. The work of Rick Hanyashek and others have shown that teachers improve very quickly in their first couple of years, but after that, they slow down. Now, some people have claimed that teachers actually stop improving, and that may be due to the fact that the experiments that were being done weren't very sensitive to the slower changes that happen after the first couple of years. But there's no doubt that the variability of teacher performance after, say, 10 years is just about as great as it is at the beginning, which suggests we're not getting what you find in other areas which is this convergence on elite performance if people do 10 years of deliberate practice. So the argument so far is that we need to create situations within which teachers continue to improve well beyond the levels that they do right now. Most teachers improve very quickly in their first and second and third years. And then most teachers slow down and some actually stop improving after three years. But many don't, many carry on getting better. And I think this is because some teachers push themselves to get better when nobody else is pushing them. After you've been teaching three years, you've got the basic routines down, you could actually just go into autopilot mode. And some teachers do that. But the best teachers say, I'm good, I may be the best teacher in the school already, but the fact is I'm going to push myself to get even better because when I do my job better, my students will benefit. So. The question is, what should we improve? And of course, I'm arguing that formative assessment should be the focus of the improvement in teachers. And this is really significant because it involves a very different kind of change from the kinds of changes that typically accompany professional development. So I'm drawing on the work of Jeffrey Pfeffer here, who talks about the knowing doing gap. And he's done research in companies that have looked at, you know, what's going wrong, why aren't we succeeding? And what they've discovered is far more companies go bankrupt, go broke, because they had the right plans poorly executed than because they had the wrong plans. They knew what they should be doing, they just weren't doing it. And here's one um, set of data from Jeffrey Pfeffer's book, The Knowing Doing Gap, where people were asked to rate on a one to six scale. You know, Are we doing this and should we be doing this? And what you can see is for each of the ideas to improve organizational performance, you can see that the we know we should do this score is higher than the we are doing this score. They know what they should be doing, they're just not doing it. And this is very important in terms of teacher development because it highlights the issue as being one of habit change. Too often we conceptualize teacher improvement as giving teachers new knowledge we expect teachers to keep up to date with new ideas. I don't think there have been many new ideas in the last 2,000 years in teaching. I think writing, you know, when it first came into schooling in, in ancient Greece was a pretty radical revolution, but since then, I don't think much has changed. So I don't think there are that many new ideas. What we need is to help teachers develop the ideas they already have. And that means we have to think of professional development in a very different way. Specifically, we have to think of professional development as a process of habit change. So what we need from teachers is a commitment to continue to improve their practice and a focus on those things that make a difference to students. That's where the research evidence comes in. What leaders need to do then is to commit to engineer effective learning environments for their teachers by firstly creating expectations for the continual improvement of practice. The idea is that even if you're already the best teacher in the school, you need to be even better because when you do your job better, your students will live longer, be healthier and contribute more to society. The second challenge for leaders, and I deal with this quite extensively in the book, is one of the hardest things of all is keeping the focus on the things 
that we know we should be doing. People are always looking for the next big thing, like learning study or lesson study or neuroscience. And what I'm arguing is we haven't done the last big thing yet. And because we know that when teachers do classroom formative assessment, their students learn more, we shouldn't stop focusing on that until every teacher is doing it to a level where there's no further benefit to be gained in working on that anymore, and then we can look for new things. But let's stop looking for the next big thing. Let's make sure we're doing the last big thing. Then, of course, it's giving teachers time to improve. The, the time, the space, the permission, if you like, to improve and support innovation and supporting teachers in taking risks. And so I just want to um, suggest that in order to do this, we need to look at a very different set of research publications, particularly the research on habit change. And so um, Chip and Dan Heath, in a very well-written book called Switch, suggest that the research on habit change can be organized under three headings. They take the metaphor of the rider and the elephant. So the idea is you've got a rider on the back of the elephant. The rider is rational and the elephant is emotional. But the third element they add is the path. So you think of an elephant riding around and being directed around a city landscape, even the elephant isn't strong enough to walk through buildings. So the path constrains them. So what they do is they actually highlight three strategies for each of the areas, direct the rider, motivate the elephant, and shape the path. So I'll just give you one example from each of these areas. So um, follow the bright spots. Jerry and Monique Sternin worked for Save the Children, and they were posted to a village in Vietnam to help outcomes, improve outcomes for young children, and malnutrition was a real problem, and of course, the classic things like better um, sanitation, more money, weren't available to them. So what they decided to do was to, was to look at families where there wasn't any malnutrition, and they found that these mothers were feeding their babies in a different way. They were feeding them four times a day rather than twice. They carried on feeding their babies when they had um, their diarrhea. They were supplementing the, the diet with uh, freshwater shrimps, which were regarded as unsuitable for young children. And so what they did was they suggested that these mothers ran cookery classes for the other mothers. Ten years later, an evaluation of health outcomes for young children in this village, ten years after Jerry and Monique Sterling had left, found that actually malnutrition had been ab ab abolished. But the point was it worked because they followed the bright spots. They didn't impose a solution from outside. They started with what was working locally and amplified it. Um, motivate the elephant. One example is um, find the feeling. So the head of procurement at a, a car, a parts maker for a for the car industry, Delphi Automotive, discovered that his organization across the 23 plants that they operated was buying 424 pairs of protective glove, 424 different kinds of protective glove. And so he knew that if he raised it as an issue, the vice presidents would say, we must do something about it, but nothing would change. So what he did was, one day he snuck into the boardroom before a board meeting and he piled up 424 pairs of gloves on the table. And the vice presidents walked in and he said that their jaws literally dropped. It was the emotional impact of seeing 424 pairs of gloves that got them to change how they were ordering gloves, not the appeal to saving money. And finally, tweak the environment. And this is very important in terms of shaping teacher learning. Brian Wansink has done a lot of research on people's eating habits. In one study, they took over a Chicago movie theater. It was actually for the premiere of Mel Gibson's film, Payback. And they took over this theater for the 115 showing. And as people were walking into the theater, they were offered free tubs of popcorn if they would answer some questions about the popcorn at the end of the movie. And the, the cover story was they were evaluating the concessions. What the people didn't know is that the tubs of popcorn were randomly filled with either four ounces or eight ounces of popcorn. And the other thing they didn't know was the popcorn had been prepared seven days earlier. 
and kept in sterile conditions so that it was really stale. It was squeaky stale. One person described it later as like eating styrofoam packing peanuts. So when the people came out of the movie theater, they handed over their tubs and they were asked to fill in the questionnaire. They then weighed the tubs and, the found, and found that the people who'd been given four ounce tubs had on average eaten two ounces of popcorn. But the people who'd been given the eight ounce tubs had eaten three ounces of popcorn, 50% more, even though it wasn't very nice and they'd probably just eaten lunch because it was the 115 showing. And even more interestingly, people were asked, did the amount of popcorn you were given influence how much they, that you ate? And everybody said no. So these are the nine strategies that Chip and Dan Heath reckon will actually help us help people help us help people change their habits. And so what is the, our model, if you like, is based on this idea. The idea is we follow the bright spots. So we start with volunteers. We script the critical moves. We have highly structured meetings. The idea is that we tie the meetings down to the nearest minute, actually, so the teachers don't, just don't just end up talking around in circles. And we have this big, hairy, audacious goal, as it's been called by some management gurus, whatever it takes. We're going to get every single kid achieving at a level of proficiency, whatever it takes. We have to reconnect teachers to the moral imperative. That's why I started with this idea of we're going to make a difference in the world. We have to shrink the change, so we're not going to tell teachers to revolutionize the way they teach, taking small steps, and we have to create this idea that every teacher can get better. Carol Dweck's idea of mindset has become very um, popular recently, but most people apply it to students. I think it's important we apply it to teachers, the idea that all teachers can improve. That's why I only have one question for every teacher. Can you get better? If they say yes, let's work together. If you say no, I think you should be fired because I don't think there's any place in public schools for teachers who don't think they need to get better because when they fail, they end up blaming the students. So I think the most important mindset is really the teacher mindset that actually I can be a better teacher tomorrow than I was today. And then we change the environment the teachers work in. We build in time for teacher learning, not something that happens on a few summer institutes or a few days when the schools are closed, but actually is hardwired into the working cycle of the school. We create routines and structures, and we create a group um, mentality around the importance of pushing the envelope, of making a few new mistakes. This is Esther Dyson's motto, make new mistakes. Obviously, there's no excuse for making the same mistake over and over again, but there's no excuse for making no mistakes at all. That's why we should be making new mistakes. And finally, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about getting it done. I'll just present you with this case study of an urban school district called, that I've called Cannington. So we got some funding to run a project on improving teaching, and the district identified mathematics, science, and modern languages teaching as a particular priority. So these principals agreed to release teachers for this project at their own expense and agreed to make sure that each of these teachers got to meet once a month for the following year, for just 75 minutes once a month. So I ran some workshops, one for the math teachers, one for the science teachers, one for the languages teachers. And the numbers in black there show how many each of the high schools in the district, how many teachers they sent to the meeting. So you can see the Poplar School sent 11 math teachers to the, to the first workshop. The blue bars show how much progress they'd actually made in the following year on getting those eight monthly meetings conducted. And one bar means no progress, four bars means very good progress. And what you can see there is at Poplar School, although they sent 11 math teachers to the event, they made no progress. Um, shown in a different way, here's the correlation of the number of teachers attending the training event for each of the workshops and how much progress the teacher learning community has made in Canada. The correlation is actually 0 0.01. So I went back to the principals the following year and I said, I showed them these data, and I said, you said that you're going to give these teachers 75 minutes once a month. He said, you said this was a priority. They said, it is. I said, yes, but you said it was a top priority. And they said, it is. I said, how many other top priorities do you have? And they said, 
many. And this is the problem. Actually, all of these schools were under pressure to improve results, but what they couldn't do was to take things off the teacher's plate to give them time to work on improvement. So the big idea here is that we, will get, we can actually create huge improvements in school achievement if we just get teachers time to work together in this structured way. Now it's not going to produce changes overnight and therefore people get very worried when they're investing time in something that isn't actually changing things straight away. So what we've also done is to do some thinking about what we might call leading indicators of success. Obviously, ultimately, the goal is increased student achievement, but it's good to know that you're on the right track. So the first one, and the most important, is that teachers are given time to meet and do so. Simple as that. If teachers are given time to meet and work on these ideas, they will actually become better teachers. We see teachers increasingly becoming critical friends, not accepting something that another teacher has said just because they're a professional and actually a bit of robustness in the conversation. As teachers do these walkthroughs, or as, sorry, as leaders do the walkthroughs, they'll see more formative assessment practices. Students report more engagement in classrooms. And in particular, teachers will be modifying the, the techniques in ways that show they really get the big ideas. That's one of the key ways you can tell the teachers are understanding this is that they make smart adjustments when things don't go according to plan. And ultimately, there's a shift in the ownership of the reform. Lee mentioned we have this set of professional development resources around strategic formative assessment. And we prepared two years of materials for teachers uh, for these eight monthly meetings every year for two years. People ask us, when is year three coming out? And year three is never coming out because if years one and two have worked properly, then the teachers will take this over. And if teachers aren't ready to take this over, they need to go back to doing years one and two over again. The big idea here is that ultimately, this should actually put teachers in charge of their own professional learning. The, lag, the lagging indicator of success is increased student achievement. In any effort like this, you have to think about the reaction of key stakeholders, like in, sec in high schools, departments like the maths department will be different from the science department. Unions need to be involved. Teaching assistants, I think, need to be incorporated. Um, teachers' aides, school board and community leaders need to be involved as well. So I think people need to be kept on, on side with this and you need to manage those reactions. And you also need to manage disappointments. And the key thing here, and this is, this is the last slide really, um, the key idea here is whether failure is a chance for learning or blame. What they discovered in hospitals is that when pe things go wrong, you can either find out what went wrong or you can pin the blame on somebody, but you can't do both because people cover up. So high reliability organizations embrace failure. There's an oil company operating in the Gulf of Mexico who've founded a $1 million club. Membership is restricted to people who've made a mistake that's cost the company at least a million dollars. These people are regarded as, as having something special to teach the organization about how to learn from failure. And perhaps the best way of summarizing this is, is a complaint is a gift. If you get people complaining about this, find out why they're complaining. Most people in education really want the best for students. So if people are saying this won't work or this can't work or this is impossible, find out why, because they probably have some insights that you haven't got. And then finally, remembering that group work Getting students to work together is really hard for teachers. Getting students to work effectively together is one of the last skills that most teachers acquire. And that's why it's also very hard for teachers of teachers. So it's very difficult, but ultimately worthwhile. And I'll hand back to Lee um, to actually take us through any questions that people have come up with. To find out more about these things, the, these ideas, You've got the two books on the practical techniques and the book that I've been talking about today, Leadership for Teacher Learning. Lee. Thank you so much, Dylan. Yes, the, uh, you can find those books on our, on our website. The, uh, 